welcome into the Profile Series. I'm Matt Pitta from Quantum Communications. Thanks for being with us today. We're going to be talking politics on this edition of our program. There's going to be a contested race this year for the 9th Congressional District, the newly configured 9th Congressional District from just a couple of years ago. On the Republican side, several candidates are in the running, and joining us today is one of those Republican candidates, Mark Allegro from Woods Hole. Mark? Thank you. See you. Thank, Thank you for, for having me, today. Matt. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for stopping by. Mm -hmm. So the 9th Congressional District was recon, well, redistricted a couple of years ago to the new district that we have now, which stretches basically from Fall River across to Plymouth, over to the Cape, and just a little bit north of Plymouth as well. And when that seat was redistricted, William Keating, the former Norfolk County District Attorney, uh, picked up that seat. And uh, this is going to be uh, his uh, re-election campaign coming up in November. There are going to be, I think we still have, what, four Republicans that are in the race at this point seeking the Republican nomination Correct. to run against William Keating. No Democrat has come forward to challenge him for the Democratic nomination. So why don't we start out, Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, researcher from Woods Hole and the Oceanographic institution so introduce yourself uh, to the television audience today sure so close I'm actually at the marine biological Sorry laboratory and that. that's okay everybody knows the oceanographic institute because they have the big ships so that's on right. television uh, but the MBL is a fabulous place to work and we have our own rich history uh, as a matter of fact the MBL was the uh, the founder our director our second director was the founder of the oceanographic institute but I'm a uh, cell and molecular biologist and um, I have a faculty appointment to the MBL and also I'm a professor of molecular biology at Brown University. So we've been living in Falmouth for the past seven years, my wife of 32 years and I, uh, but we've been coming to the MBL for over three decades for summer research. So we're familiar with the area, we love the area, have loved the MBL since uh, you know, time immemorial. It's been, it's been like a dream for us to come to, to Woods Hole. So why politics? I mean, you're in a position uh, at MBL, you know, mm -hmm. with, uh, I'm sure it's uh, been enriching for you, and you're also brown, as you said, over in Rhode Island. So what has led you to make the decision to, to make this jump into the uh, world of politics, which uh, can be a little bit uh, topsy-turvy, if you will? Sure. Can't sit around anymore. I can't sit around anymore and just watch what's happening to this country. And it affects us in our daily life at the MBL, just like it does in small businesses across the country, or uh, you know, whether you're in the public or the private sector. Uh, people are losing their freedoms. If, if by nothing else, by the dint of the massive regulatory complex we've built uh, in this country. So uh, you spend too much of your time dealing with paperwork. But it's not that. I think we're just we're we're losing what this country meant, and what it is. And um, I decided that I can't just go about my daily life and do that anymore. Had to get involved like this. Now you're running for the Republican nomination. Other candidates in the race include John Chapman, uh, Vince Cogliano, Dan Shores. So d take a few moments here and distinguish yourself. Uh, from the other candidates that are running for the Republican nomination, what sets you aside from these other GOP candidates? Sure, well, naturally not as much as sets us all aside from, from Mr. Keating, but uh, two of the four of us are attorneys, and uh, that's good. They're educated and highly trained men, but we have an awful lot of attorneys in Washington, D.C., and we need people with different perspective, I think. Uh, Vince Cogliano, uh, nice fellow, he's a businessman, um, so we also have a different background from each other. I'm a, uh, a researcher <clears throat> and a teacher, and I look at information as it comes in. I, for my whole life, am trained to analyze it objectively and then to interpret it and to act upon it. So what I've taken to telling people is I answer questions for a living. That's what I do in the laboratory. It's what I do in the classroom. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered these days. So I think that background adds to, uh, to my suitability. Um, but on top of that, there are a lot of issues that really have roots in some scientific and analytical uh, fields. Uh, one of the things that we talk about all the time uh, is climate change, what's, what's happening with our, with our Earth. So there are, uh, and actually in this district, we have this uh, redistricting of the flood maps, mm -hmm. which is in theory based upon some scientific data. So I have a little bit of a unique perspective along those lines as well. Now, when you take a look at this district, uh, it is <coughs> very diverse in the sense that you have cities like Fall River and New mm -hmm. Bedford, which have just really honestly struggled for the last several years, now honestly a couple of decades, in terms of trying to find a way out 
of economic redevelopment. Then you have uh, more affluent parts of the district, mm -hmm. some of the suburbs, Plymouth, some of the Cape Towns. But you also have a whole different set of issues with a regional economy, a seasonal economy, excuse me, down here on the Cape. So take me through the district, if you would. You know, you can go west to east, east to west, mm -hmm. north to south. Talk about specific issues from Fall River to Provincetown to Plymouth that you think affect each of those regions. I always look at the 9th District as basically breaking it up into three regions. Mm -hmm. Cape and Islands, Plymouth, Greater Plymouth, and the South Coast, New Bedford, Fall River. So take us through what you think are the big issues for each of those regions. Sure, well, I'm gonna talk on a national scale. I mean, uh, there are local issues, and they're not necessarily the purview of a U.S. House, rep of, uh, a US House rep. Uh, but still, some of these local issues have roots in national type issues. So let me talk about Falmouth because that's where I'm from. So I'll I'll begin there. Um, you know, it may seem like a small issue to the uh, to the rest of the district, but in Falmouth we have these wind turbines that have gone up, and uh, they've they've torn uh, the fabric of Falmouth. I've not seen in my life neighbor pitted against neighbor like I've seen at town meeting uh, over these wind turbines. So there's one issue, right? The, the wind term. Uh, so this touches on the bigger debate in the country about uh, energy sources. Me, I'm for every and any uh, energy source that we can develop, but there's a place for each and every one of them. And there's a way to attain an efficient means of extracting energy from that system. So <clears throat> let's look at wind turbines. If you have uh, 20,000 acres in Idaho and you want to rent 5,000 of it to a company uh, that, that produces energy by wind turbine, that's great. It's miles away from anybody, it's not beating overhead in some neighbor's yard, but you don't plunk them down in your neighbor's backyard in Falmouth, Massachusetts in residential areas. So we learned a lesson there. You know, a few years ago the Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to put them in, and now the Board of Selectmen has voted unanimously to take them out, and this is going to cost the town of Falmouth millions, millions of dollars. But they're going to come down and they need to come down. It's a national issue, it's an issue that communities across the country are facing. We could move to another area, let's look at uh, the Plymouth area. <clears throat> and um, we have this uh, um, extension of the Marshfield uh, runway going in. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, again, you're having a, a um, tension between environmental concerns and uh, business development concerns. And I'm hearing both sides of it. And I have to tell you that, as is often the case, both sides have merit. Um, I believe they're going to increase the length of that runway by a little less than 10 percent, or just about 10 percent. They're going to add on a little taxiing areas, another 10 percent. Um, but there's a lot of tension uh, it, it, you know, in changes in materials that are going in and whether or not they were assessed properly. Let me jump to one that's, that's affecting the whole district, because I know we don't have a whole lot of time here. And that's the National Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012 otherwise known as the Bigger Waters Act. This whole district, uh, all three of the major areas you talked about, are pretty much surrounded by water. Mm -hmm. So this is big. People who have never been flooded before and were never in a flood district find themselves suddenly having to buy flood insurance and the price is way inflated. Now, these new maps were designed on missing, outdated, and faulty data. We can discuss, if you choose, how that data was brought into the picture. It's not important at the moment. That's not conjecture on my part. That's why the entire congressional delegation of Massachusetts are running around like heroes trying to put the skids on this thing in Washington, D.C. They're going to become our saviors now and get this thing put off and, and redone. What I would like to remind everybody is that two years ago, when this came before Congress and before the Senate, our entire Massachusetts congressional delegation voted to pass the Bigger Waters Act. So this is a major issue. There are people who are not going to be able to afford the new flood insurance rates. It could lead to people losing their homes. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you think happened? You're saying that the entire nine-member delegation voted for this. Well, 11 with the two senators. With the two senators. So. Did they not read it? Did they not really know what was in it? If, if, it, if we're at the point now where we're learning that, we've since learned that some of the data or almost all of the data was based on Pacific Coast uh, research, which mm -hmm. is completely different than what we have here 
uh, on, on the Atlantic coast. So what happened? What did they do wrong? Well, in right. Your opinion? So f a little plug for having a couple of scientists in Congress is that <laughs> if they had brought me, you know, that's like asking me to uh, to interpret data on the pancreas right. that's taken from the liver. Okay, right. I think I would have picked that up. Um, what happened? Well, you pointed out a big one right there. It's it, I think it's about 1,200 pages. 1,200 pages. Now, who is going to read that? Staff members? Maybe six staff members are going to sit down. Nobody really reads 1,200 pages, especially when these bills are brought up with such short lead time. So this is a fundamental issue that we have to deal with throughout our lawmaking in this country. Look, by contrast, the U.S. Constitution is about 15, 16 typewritten pages. That's about, if you stacked them on this table here, it'd be about the thickness of a dime or a nickel, okay? Now let's look at the uh, Affordable Care Act and its associated regulations. Together, they're about 65, 70,000 pages, and they stack over seven feet above the doorway. If you brought them in on a dolly, you wouldn't be able to fit them through the door. So I understand that people like to think things are a little more complicated now than they were then, but not that much different. Matt, you couldn't understand this legislation. I couldn't understand it and we're reasonably intelligent men. I don't think anybody can understand the legislation that comes before their, their uh, glasses right now. Mark Allegro is with us today on the Profile Series. He's one of the Republicans running for the 9th Congressional District. Mark, uh, as we're sitting here today, a couple days ago, there was an early <coughs> election in Florida mm -hmm. that both political parties were looking at as a potential harbinger of what is gonna happen coming up in November. One of the big issues, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. Uh, both parties were in many ways looking at that as the trial run for what's going to happen coming up in November. And based on what happened, the Republican won the race by about two or so percentage points. And so each party kind of took a little victory in it. Mm -hmm. The Republicans nationally said, look what we did. You know, we took this seat. Democrats say, this was not, an, this was not a referendum on Obamacare. This was only a two-point margin of victory. You're going to be, if you are the nominee in the general election, uh, would be running against the incumbent Democrat. Are these congressional races around the country going to be solely about a referendum on Obamacare? Solely, no. No. So, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's a popular theme and it's one that reaches into people's hearts and into their pockets. So it is going to be a big issue. The race in Florida was not a slam dunk for either party. <clears throat> Um, so the margin was, as you said, less than two points, I think. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of other extenuating circumstances there, and one is that we had a third candidate in the race who, and I, I didn't follow this candidate closely, but he, he described himself as a libertarian. And my sense is he's probably going to take more seats, more, more votes away from the, the Republican slash conservative candidate. Mm -hmm. So the victory was probably a little bit more than those two points. But worse than that, uh, for the Democrat side, is that this is a district that has been trending Democratic. Obama won it in 2008 and in 2012, and Ms. Sink won it when she ran for governor. <clears throat> so you had a candidate who had statewide recognition in a district that was trending her way. There were enormous quantities of money. She raised about three or four times as much as her opponent. Her opponent was probably not the ideal candidate. He was a relatively young man, probably relatively inexperienced. And yet he still came away, even with the third candidate uh, winning that race. So Republicans shouldn't be leaping up and clicking their heels, but Democrats should be worried. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mark, uh, <clears throat> this campaign coming up is going to be uh, Congressman Keating's uh, third or second reelection campaign. He won, <clears throat> won reelection mm -hmm. two years ago and won the seat two years prior to that. Uh, how would you rate him? Uh, you know, obviously you're <laughs> from the other side of the aisle. Sure. Here. But, you know, if you would, give me an honest assessment, successes and failures of Congressman Keating since he's been in office. I think the easiest way to do that is to sum it up in just some numbers. I think he's got about a 93 or 95 percent record of voting with uh, Ms. Pelosi. And to break it down a little bit more specifically, every time any issue having to do with uh, the Affordable Care Act or the Unaffordable Care Act has come up, he's voted in support of it. Uh, he voted for the Bigger Waters Act, and on and on and on. You can go down the whole, shall we call it the progressive agenda, which is not working in this country. It's not working. That's his agenda. He's a rubber stamp for the president. 
the president's policies are not working. Mr. Keating, I've never met. I'm told he's a very nice man and a gentleman, and I have no doubt about that. But um, we're going to talk about his record, his voting record, a lot. I don't think it's the voting record that people in the 9th Congressional District would want to see. In the uh, time we have left, when you take a realistic look at the political landscape mm -hmm. of Massachusetts, we have uh, a legislative dele or congressional delegation, nine Democrats in the House, two Democratic senators. Uh, on Beacon Hill, Democratic officials in all the constitutional offices right now. Realistically, mm -hmm. what, what's a Republican's chances in this state, what people would call the, one of the blue or the bluest? Yeah in winning a congressional seat from a sitting Democrat? Yeah. I wouldn't be running if I thought it was a ridiculous long shot. I'd tell people we're going to deliver to the outside world. It's going to look like a stunner in November. But not to the inside world, not here in Massachusetts, because <clears throat> Plymouth and uh, the 9th Congressional District are a relatively conservative district, is a relatively conservative district. And if you go back in some of the recent elections, you know these numbers better than I do, I'm sure. Uh, the th last three senatorial elections, Scott Brown when he won, Scott Brown when he lost, uh, Gabriel Gomez when he lost, they all still won the 9th Congressional District. I understand that there's not a direct translation uh, you know, between a senatorial race and, and a congressional race. This is a district that not only could be, but should be Republican, and I think it's probably trending more Republican. Now, add to that, um, we've had some good candidates come up uh, on our side in this, uh, in this district, but I think they're going to get a little different flavor this time around than they've gotten before. Um, I, I don't know, except to describe myself as a fighter. Um, when the mud starts flying, and I'm sure it will, uh, if the record is any indication, my friends are not going to see the kind of backpedaling and apology that they're used to seeing. So it's a different candidate. It's a candidate with a different background, whole set of different strengths and weaknesses than they've seen before. I'm determined to win this. I make no predictions. I never do, because I'm a big boy. And, and I, I played enough baseball, rugby, and everything else to know that the game ain't over right until the whistle blows. So I make no predictions and no promises, um, except that um, if you vote for this candidate, you're going to get someone who actually upholds the oath of office, someone who actually upholds the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and our constitutional freedoms are a big issue this cycle. Mark, I think we have a, a few moments left. You talked about kind of who you would be as a candidate. Let me ask you this. If you win the nomination for the Republican Party and if you were to uh, defeat the sitting incumbent congressman, what is your satisfaction level right now with Republican leadership in the House? If, a, if there was to be a vote on Speaker Boehner and other leadership, where would you stand? Where are you right now? And the and second part of that question, who would you best describe or compare yourself as uh, to a, a, a sitting Republican on the national level, in some, someone in Congress? Yeah. So first question, <clears throat> I always have to, um, again, you know, I try to observe, observe objectively, and, and when you're, um, you know, when you're looking through the microscope, if the light goes out, you don't know what's happening down there. You can't make a judgment. When you're not in those rooms behind those closed doors, and sharing in the kind of information that's being exchanged, it's awful tough to judge someone like Speaker Boehner. Um, so there are times he says things or supports positions that make me scratch my head a little. On the other hand, I look at the final outcome, and. My judgment is, is that he's pretty much been having the president for lunch for a number of years now. So uh, I would like to see him say things and maybe do some things different, but um, uh, I'll reserve judgment on his job until I'm there hearing. And who would you most compare yourself <clears throat> to, currently elected sitting Republican in office? Gosh, you know, I honestly don't think I can answer that. I, I really don't. There's nobody else like me. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> That's one what of my kind, mother right? said anyway. You're one of a kind. My mother used to tell me, right. Well, Mark, thanks for stopping by our profile series. Uh, we have many months to go to mm -hmm. the campaign. The primary is coming up in the fall. Mark Allegro is one of the four candidates, one of the four Republican candidates running for the 9th Congressional District. Mark, thanks for being with us today on Profile. We appreciate it. Good luck on the campaign trail. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for the opportunity to reach out today. Sure thing. And thanks for being with us today on the Profile Series.